Well, good morning once again. And uh, today we will be beginning our discussion of Homer's Odyssey, having successfully gone through the Iliad. Um, it is now the turn of the Odyssey, the second great epic attributed to Homer. We have already mentioned as we were discussing the Homeric question, I remind you, the very question of <clears throat> the historicity of Homer, whether he existed, um, how he composed uh, his poetry, where he was born, uh, where he traveled, um, how did he come about the material for his uh, uh, poems, and so on and so forth, and of course, uh, whether it was he, whoever he was, who composed both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, this, more or less, lies at the very heart of the Homeric question, uh, whether the two epics can be attributed to the same poet. Uh, now, the question is undecided still, uh, nor does it seem that it ever will be decided. Uh, however, <clears throat> it seems to me, as well as to, to others, that it is not so likely that roughly at the same time there would have arisen two great poetic uh, 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 masters of such great unparalleled genius so as to compose two works that are of more or less the same artistic quality. And um, that being said, we've already uh, mentioned that in the eyes of the ancients themselves, Homer was one and the same person. Uh, but also, mind you, the question of whether it really was just one person who composed both epics is not a modern one. Uh, it began sometime in the second century BC. Those who looked upon the Odyssey as the work of a separate poet, uh, they were called the separatists. The Greek word is horizontes. Um, the separatists who thought that it was a different artist, a different poet behind uh, the Odyssey, and of course, uh, the, the uh, older, the original poet, poetic genius, um, composed the Iliad. However, that was not, I believe, a very uh, popular and prevalent uh, position. Uh, rather, the more common view was that both poems, both epics, were the work of one poetic genius, namely of Homer. But just so that you are aware of, of, of this notion, um, it is important for me to reiterate it, to mention it again, that there are still those who do not uh, call the Odyssey Homer's Odyssey or the, the Odyssey of, uh, of Homer, rather they say the poet of the Odyssey, whoever he was, they refrain from mentioning the name of Homer with the Odyssey. And, and that is acceptable. For us, however, uh, the traditional ground is <clears throat> more convenient. And uh, in my view, and so in, so in the view of, of, of the translators whose uh, translations we, we read, um, Homer stands behind the, the Odyssey. Uh, for example, Richmond Latimore's translation is, is so-called, the Odyssey of Homer. And the excerpts that we are going to look at today from the acclaimed translation by Robert Fagels. Um, so Robert Fagels's translation has on its frontispiece, that is the, 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 the first page of, of the translation, 
Homer, the Odyssey. So um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's con convenient to refer to the author of the Odyssey as Homer. Now, the tradition behind the two epics is the same, that is the oral tradition. Uh, there is again, no, no doubt that the uh, Odyssey is the product of oral poetry. It's based on the same principles, the same recurring epithets, the same heroic world that is above and beyond our own modern world. And, and for that matter, the world of Homer himself sometime in the eighth century BC. Um, the Homeric age as distinguished from later ages um, is characterized or the, the heroic age, sorry, the heroic age as distinguished from, from other ages um, is characterized by, as we said, greater, more courageous men able to uh, accomplish feats beyond what is humanly possible, such as Diomedes who uh, picks up a rock. No five men who live today could pick that rock up. Uh, women are far more beautiful than they've ever been since. Uh, the gods themselves uh, uh, intermingle with humans, uh, intermarry with them. Uh, so it, it is a, a world removed from what we take as uh, our modern world, the world of, of men and women of humanity, uh, in which divinity, as far as I know, is not uh, apparent, okay? The gods do not walk among us, at least uh, uh, as far as I can tell. Perhaps they do, but I, I, I've never seen one yet. Um, so uh, that is the same ambience, the same general atmosphere uh, that uh, uh, we find in the Odyssey, the same as in the Iliad. Of course, the, the, the language, the Homeric dialect, the um, uh, formulaic uh, character of the work, again, with the recurring phrases, lines, sometimes even paragraphs, um, are all the same. And the Odyssey also assumes a knowledge of the Iliad. How do we know that? Because some of the heroes of the Iliad reappear in the Odyssey, albeit not in the same context, of course. We see again Menelaus and Nestor and Helen, who is now safely back home in Sparta uh, after she has been uh, uh, regained uh, from Troy, from burning Troy, that is. So we see them again, and of course, we also see Achilles, not as a person of flesh and blood, but as a ghost, uh, as a specter in the underworld, in Hades, uh, where he speaks with Odysseus and says the famous lines that he would rather be a farmer's not exactly slave, but uh, a servant, say, in the world of the living, rather than lord it over all the dead. Okay, so it is better to be uh, a, a slave among the living than a king among the dead. Uh, and and we've we've seen we've seen that that notion of Achilles, also in the Iliad, if you remember in book nine, while he was still among the living, when he <clears throat> told Odysseus and the, the two uh, uh, other emissaries that uh, had been sent to him by Agamemnon to try and win him over uh, to, to, uh, to come back to the fighting. So if you remember, uh, we, saw, we saw that passage where Achilles says, uh, well, horses and treasures are, are there for the taking, for, for the taking. They can be taken and lost and taken up again. But a man's life, once it departs, never returns. 
Uh, and now that uh, Achilles uh, himself is among the dead, he more or less thinks the same. He is king among the dead, but he would rather be a slave among the living than a king among, uh, among the dead. So again, Achilles returns in the Odyssey and Agamemnon also is mentioned uh, uh, in, in the Odyssey and also speaks in it in, in right at the very end in the 24th book of, of the Odyssey. Um, so the Iliad clearly, uh, the Odyssey clearly assumes a, a knowledge of the Iliad. Uh, the, 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 the style, the manner of expression is the same. Uh, the gods are uh, the same gods as, as were in, in the Iliad and take as active a part in, in the story, in the plot itself. However, the Odyssey is a markedly different poem from uh, the Iliad. And why? Because the main theme on which it revolves, on which it hinges, is entirely different. The Iliad revolves around war and the heroic code. It is a poem of war, of conflict, of clashing armies, um, of much death and sorrow and wailing is we saw, even when it comes down to the most intimate of scenes, uh, that uh, uh, of the encounter of Hector and his wife Andromache, even there, sorrow is the main theme. Andromache knows that Hector is going to die. Hector himself knows that uh, Troy is doomed. And nevertheless, he continues uh, to fight. The Odyssey takes place in a world of peace, a troubled peace, that is, uh, without, without a doubt, but still peace. There's no great conflict uh, 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 in it, none that is looming ahead. Of course, it is always uh, 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 conscious of the great war that had just ended. Uh, it is no secret that uh, the Odyssey begins 20 years after the outbreak of the Trojan War, or 10 years after the end of the Trojan uh, War. So the Trojan War um, is a major component of the story of the Odyssey as well, but it is over. There's no war uh, in the Odyssey. The Odyssey is a poem that belongs in the days of peace. It, I would say, uh, hinges on, revolves around the, 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 the principle of Xenia. I will write it for you, just a second. Xenia is Okay, so Xenia is the sacred relationship between host and guest. Okay. The sacred relationship between host and guest. Sacred relationship between host and guest. And it was a very important principle in the archaic Greek world. Basically, it means that if I am a stranger, a foreigner, at your door, it is imperative that you accept me into your house and offer me hospitality and give me shelter. Even if you don't really want to do that, you are obliged to do it. You are uh, 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 expected by, I would say, uh, uh, religious law to do it. And why do I say religious law? Because there is a God 
who observes the uh, uh, principle of Xenia, and he is none other than Zeus himself. Let's honor him by capitalizing his name. <laughs> Zeus aptly termed Xenios. Zeus Xenios, that is Zeus who looks after uh, guests and suppliants. Again, if I am a wanderer, a beggar, a suppliant seeking shelter at your door, you must entertain me. You must show me hospitality. You must be cordial and, uh, and lavish upon me food and drink and, uh, and shelter for as long as, as I require these, uh, these things. And upon parting, there is a, um, an exchange of gifts. The host gives his suppliant, his guest, a gift, a gift of hospitality, some token that that suppliant, that guest, be him, uh, be he a, 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 a king, or, 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 a, or a pauper, uh, that is a beggar, uh, it matters not. As a token that he received Xenia, received hospitality from that host. Why? So that, and, and, and of course the host keeps uh, uh, a part of that token as well, uh, so that Sometime in the future, if, if the host chances to come to, to, to his former guest's uh, uh, land and he then asks for Xenia, then that former guest, now turned host, is obliged to uh, accommodate him. And that was perhaps the one sure thing, the one certainty that people in the archaic age had of safety in, 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 in foreign lands. There was no international law. Piracy was rampant. Uh, you could be murdered along the road. No one to protect you. That is why Xenia was so important. And that is why I say that it lies at the very heart of the Odyssey. And if you know the plot of the Odyssey, you know that it is true. Why? Odysseus in his wanderings was a guest of many. Uh, some who showed reverence to Xenia and accommodated him and his companions, of course, but others who despised and disregarded Xenia to, to, to uh, uh, outrageous levels. The most obvious example being... Cyclops. Yes, Polyphemus, the Cyclops. And, and it's, it's, it's written, we will read it today, of course. It's written there very, very plainly. How could you have broken the rules of Xenia, of hospitality, disregarding the gods and above all, Zeus. On the other hand, uh, the, the great uh, 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 paragon, paragons of, 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 of Xenia, that is the exemplar, uh, the exemplary uh, uh, manifestation of Xenia is shown by the Phaeacians, that legendary people on whose shores uh, Odysseus finds himself and um, is treated very uh, uh, cordially, uh, receives uh, really impeccable hospitality, and of course is taken back home on one of their uh, uh, ships. So that they are the, uh, the manifestation of what Xenia is all about. Uh, 
And again, uh, 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 Odysseus is entertained by Circe. True, she bewitches his companions and turns them into swine. She would have done the same to Odysseus himself had he not been given forewarning by Hermes that he should drink a, 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 a certain a magic potion containing the herb molly, whatever that herb is, but it is it makes him impervious to Circe's magic. And although she wants to turn him into a pig and make him join his swine companions, he remains in mortal shape. And then she understands that he is under the uh, protection of the gods. Uh, and and he, he, he spends a whole year with her. Um, so again, uh, hospitality. Um, but in Odysseus's home on Ithaca itself, we have uh, uh, Xenia and hospitality taken to extreme. Um, Penelope and uh, Odysseus's household uh, is forced to entertain whom? All 108 suitors who come there in the hope of marrying Penelope, who by now should remarry, seeing as her husband has been absent from his kingdom for 20 years. So it is time, Penelope, to remarry. Therefore, 108 suitors from Ithaca and the surrounding islands and uh, uh, continent uh, throng in Odysseus's palace in expectation, impatient expectation, I might add, uh, uh, to wed Penelope. Uh, she, of course, uh, 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 does not want to remarry, and she beguiles them, she deceives them in, in various ways, but again, she cannot banish them from uh, Odysseus's uh, kingdom, from his house. Why? Because she must respect the rules of the land, or rather the rule of the land. There are no <laughs> rules. Um, and that is to show uh, uh, respect to guests. The suitors, however, on their part, will be punished because they have taken uh, unlawful advantage of this uh, principle of Xenia. If you are a guest, then you should act in moderation. Moderation, not anything not in excess, is very important in the Greek world. Uh, it was even, so the saying goes, inscribed uh, on the walls of uh, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. The, the, uh, the best known inscription is uh, know thyself. But after you have known yourself, you should also know that meden uh, agan, uh, that is nothing in excess. Or in other words, maintain moderation. Do not exceed the limit which is, of course, what, what, what the suitors do, uh, or rather <laughs> uh, don't do. They, they don't maintain moderation. They do exceed far and wide any reasonable limits of, of you know, being modest guests. They consume day and night the livelihood of Odysseus. Uh, every day they hold banquets in which uh, pigs and sheep are slaughtered for the feast, wine is drunk in great quantities, and they, they, they don't have to pay for all that. It is part of the expected hospitality. But once you go beyond the measure, once you cross the line, you go beyond the limit, be sure that your uh, your, your trespassing will be um, will be answered, and of course you will pay the penalty 
for not maintaining moderation. And, and, and the students are always referred to as the haughty suitors, the, the proud suitors. Uh, proud here being a, a negative uh, adjective. They are overweening, arrogant, proud, haughty. Uh, all these epithets emphasize the fact that the suitors have gone beyond what is reasonably uh, uh, permissible. So again, you have, you have here Xenia. Xenia is all, also shown by uh, Odysseus's uh, young uh, 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 boy, Telemachus, who is now a, a young man um, who receives uh, Athena, of course, he doesn't know it's Athena because she, uh, uh, she appears in the guise of, of uh, uh, you know, a uh, mortal man, Mentes, uh, a former friend of Odysseus. Uh, she appears in that, in that disguise at his gate and he quickly rushes toward her to accept her, to offer her wine and food and rest. Um, uh, also, he shows the, the, the same respect to, to his father in his disguise uh, as a beggar when, he, when, when Odysseus is already uh, on Ithaca. So it is this principle of Xenia that we find in every book of, uh, um, of the Odyssey. It is either respected, disregarded, but it's always there. And it is a mark of the days of peace and of what people in peaceful times would expect uh, uh, each other um, um, in terms of, of proper um, uh, behavior, what they would expect of each other uh, in terms of, of good and proper behavior in, in peaceful times. Good, so uh, we will begin with a, a short, really short outline of the Odyssey, and then we will uh, uh, examine the, uh, the excerpts that I, I uh, posted on, on the Moodle. Um, so see Xenia, Zeus Xenios, Zeus who looks after guests and suppliants. That is, by the way, the reason why those who disregard Xenia are punished and severely so. Um, it was Aristotle in his famous poetics um, who said that, uh, okay, it was A Aristotle in, in, in his famous poetics, I don't remember the exact chapter, uh, speaking about the greatness of the composition of the Odyssey. The Odyssey takes six weeks to unfold. I just told you that it's, it's 20 years uh, since the Trojan War began, but the plot of the Odyssey takes only six weeks or so, more or less, to unfold. Uh, the Iliad, by the way, takes um, uh, 41 days, most of which are une uneventful. Um, so it's a story that is concentrated in a short span of time and um, it is mostly told in retrospect. That is Homer's uh, technical genius, that the actual events taking place in the Odyssey uh, require six weeks, but in them we have uh, uh, stories in retrospect about things that happened before uh, um, and um, that is how, how we, we come to know about the great adventures of Odysseus, uh, the, the stories that are famous as being the Odyssey. So uh, the plot is, is, is simple, a man bereft, that is uh, 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 without 
all his worldly possessions after the Trojan War, lost at sea, um, reaches his home to find it besieged by numberless suitors of his wife. He gets his revenge, kills them all, and wins his wife back. That's uh, in, in a, you know, uh, the, the, the shortest way possible, the theme of the Odyssey. If we want to expand on that, we can say that the Odyssey, like the Iliad, is divided into 24 books. The division, as you know, is not of Homer's making. Um, the first four books are mainly concerned with Odysseus's son, Telemachus, and his coming of age. Um, he is very much frustrated at what goes on in his household. The haughty suitors who consume his, his father's livelihood. And um, he, he's also, it, it, it might be uh, understood, uh, cross with his mother for you know, being indecisive, either marry someone of the suitors or don't, but the situation as it is cannot continue for long. So in books one to four, we come to see Telemachus coming of age, that is assuming his role as Odysseus's heir. He is very much disappointed and, 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 and full of sorrow at his father's absence, so much so that he decides to go and make inquiry of what has happened to his father. So he sails away to um, Pylos and to Sparta to speak with Nestor, uh, the aged king, who has made it safe uh, uh, back to his home, and um, to Sparta. Both Pylos and, and Sparta are in the Peloponnese, that is the, the, the great uh, uh, peninsula, the, the great Greek peninsula. Um, so he sails there and um, spends uh, some time at Pylos and then at, at, at Sparta, learning of the greatness of his father from the mouths of Nestor and Menelaus. As he is heading back home, uh, the suitors plot to ambush him and kill him. Of course, they do not succeed because their efforts are frustrated by, uh, by the gods, uh, but they, they, they want to kill Telemachus. He is seen as a nuisance and a danger because he's no longer a young boy. He is now a man, a young man sporting his first beard. And it was uh, it, it, it is commonly known that Odysseus on his departure uh, uh, to Troy told Penelope that if he does not return by the time that the baby son Telemachus grows his first beard, she should remarry. And Telemachus is now a young man sporting his first beard. And it's, you know, right at the nick of time. Uh, if, if Odysseus does not appear, Penelope is going to remarry. So this is the main theme of the first four books. Odysseus does not appear in them as an active character. He is, of course, mentioned many a time, but he does not uh, uh, take active part in the story. His active part begins in book five. The Odyssey begins, by the way, uh, as I told you, a, a few days before uh, Odysseus makes, uh, maybe a few weeks before Odysseus makes landfall in Ithaca, before he returns home. So that's where we begin, 10 years after the war at Troy ended. So Odysseus spent three years wandering in what is called fairyland, because the voyages of Odysseus, um, though we, we, we would really like to, to identify uh, the places 
uh, he visited as true geographical sites, um, it is unfortunately impossible to do so with any degree of accuracy. And that is why his voyages and the different uh, landfalls uh, that he makes are all uh, called his, 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 his voyages in, in fairyland, because we do not know exactly where Aiaia, that is Circe's island, is. We do not know where the land of the Cyclopes is. Scylla and Charybdis, the famous monsters, uh, where exactly are they situated? Where are they, where are they located? We do not know. Are they really uh, a reference to the straits between Sicily and uh, southern Italy? As is commonly thought, that there's, no, there's no hard evidence uh, 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 that, that proves it. Uh, Ithaca itself, by the way, that there is an Ithaca today, but is it the Odyssean Ithaca? Probably not, because the geography modern, uh, 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 the modern ge geography of Ithaca does not square with uh, the geography of, 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 of Homer's Ithaca. So um, my interest in, in, in the Odyssey, of course, is not uh, geographical. Um, so uh, <clears throat> it doesn't really uh, trouble me so much. <clears throat> in any case, um, for three years, Odysseus travels in fairyland. Then, all alone, without any of his friends surviving, he finds himself in the island of Ogygia, ruled by the goddess, the goddess Calypso. Calypso who desires him for her husband. Now the name Calypso means she who hides. And Odysseus uh, is hidden on Calypso's island. He is an unwilling, willing prisoner. It's, it's, really unclear because he spends seven years there uh, uh, enjoying uh, his days and nights with Calypso, but also experiencing great longing and sorrow for his wife Penelope. And uh, Calypso, of course, does not set him free um, because she desires him to be her husband and she wants to give him immortality and Eternal, uh, 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 eternal youth as well. Um, so uh, he, he spends seven years on the island of Ogygia until Calypso is ordered by the gods to set him free. That happens in book five. And uh, of course, under pain of destroying her island if she does not. So she, she, she sets uh, Odysseus free and uh, he sails on, on a makeshift raft that he builds for himself. Then noticed by Poseidon, who holds great anger towards him, uh, he is once again shipwrecked and finds himself um, at book six on the shores of Scaria. Land of the Asians. Again, all these places, the, 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 of course, the, the island of, of Calypso, who would know where that lies? Or Scheria, or Scheria, the land of the Phaeacians. No one can trace it today. Well, mainly because as punishment, uh, for, for their assistance to Odysseus, Poseidon um, uh, 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 enclosed their island with mountains. So there's no telling where Scheria is today and uh, if any Phaeacians still live there. 
Um, so he uh, is on the shores of Syria, where he is found and sheltered by the princess, Nausikea, who brings him before her father, Alcinous, the king of the Phaeacians, who of course entertains him lavishly by all the standards, the good standards of Xenia, and um, shows him great respect and fabulous hospitality. This happens in books six to eight, and then in books nine to 12, Odysseus at the banquet, at the feast held very much in his own honor um, in Arsinous palace, tells the Phaeacians his story. And that is the famous Odyssey that everybody knows the story of the voyages of Odysseus, how he sailed from Troy and uh, reached, after conquering the Sicones, um, the land of the Lotus Eaters, where some of his friends who ate of the Lotus Flower became forgetful of all troubles and, were, and had to be dragged back to the ships so that they could sail on. And then they made landfall on the island of the Cyclopes, whence they sail to another island where Polyphemus resides. The grim experience that they had there, their escape and journey to the island of Iolos, king of the winds, where Odysseus received the fabulous gift of a sack containing all the recalcitrant winds except the western wind that would blow him safely back home. Odysseus is so excited that he himself holds the helm of the ship, refuses to sleep, and of course, as a result, becomes so weary that he uh, uh, falls into uncontrollable slumber, uh, during which his friends begin to suspect that uh, he has you no know, uh, fabulous treasures in that sack of Iolus. Uh, they open it and of course all the recalcitrant, fiercely blowing winds blow out and bring the ship back to Iolus uh, Island where Iolus refuses to uh, render help again, claiming that Odysseus is cursed by the gods because he gave him such a gift uh, to have lost it is really a mark of being unfavored by the gods. From there, they, uh, they, they uh, make their way to Circe's island. She in turn releases them and tells Odysseus that before he, 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 he comes home, he must make a journey to the underworld, to the house of Hades. That's the famous uh, uh, visit to the dead. It's called in Greek, the Nekuia, that is a journey to Hades, it's in book 11. Um, from there, they return back to Circe, who tells them how they should uh, 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 trace their way home, and that no matter what happens, if they find themselves on the island of Thrinatia, um, um, they must never eat the cattle there. Of course, they do eat the cattle of the sun god Helios on that uh, uh, island. And um, uh, all, of course, uh, except, except Odysseus. And as a result, they all die. That is why Odysseus uh, is left alone, drifting, shipwrecked on the high seas, and finds himself on the island of Calypso, where he remains for seven years until she is warned by the gods, as I told you, and then he makes his way to the Phaeacians, to whom he has just told all this story that I told you. 
The Phaeacians um, decide to uh, give him sa safe uh, conduct to Ithaca, um, not empty-handed, but loaded with treasures far greater than the ones he uh, had himself amassed and lost um, from Troy. And so, um, in book 13, more or less in the middle of book 13, he reaches Ithaca. So, if in book 13 he reaches Ithaca, why do we need uh, 11 more books till the end of the Odyssey? Because uh, he cannot just storm into his house and say, greetings all, I am Odysseus, come back to my kingdom, go home. And uh, let me say hello to my wife and, and young son. No, he knows that if, he, if this is what he does, he will be killed on the spot by 108 supercilious suitors. Instead, he uh, is transformed into a beggar by Athena, and by degrees, he makes himself known to his son, Telemachus, to his faithful uh, uh, um, swine herd, Eumaeus, uh, and cattle herd as well. I, I, I uh, forget his name, but there are a select few who know that uh, uh, Odysseus is home. And then, uh, as a beggar, he enters his house and is instantly recognized by whom? His old faithful dog, Argos, who sits in the dung uh, at the entrance to his house, all flea-ridden and powerless to stand because he's now 20 years old. But he recognizes his old master, Odysseus, only to uh, wag his tail and die. Um, so Odysseus is, is recognized by his dog. Uh, of course, um, uh, 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 he, he is immediately transformed into a target of, 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 of mockery by, by, by the suitors who uh, laugh at him, throw furniture at him. As I told you, they are breaking all limits of, of, of what you would expect uh, uh, should be the behavior of, of, of guests at someone else's palace. And um, well, I'm, 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 I'm skipping uh, uh, and omitting a lot of details, but um, the old nurse, Yuri Klein, uh, is is bidden wash the beggar's feet as uh, a token of, of good hospitality. And she also recognizes Odysseus. How? By his famous scar, the scar of Odysseus that he has um, on his uh, uh, calf, that is the lower part of, of the foot. And then at that very moment in book 19, when she recognizes that this is her old master, and you, you, you are so impatient to know what would happen next. How will Odysseus react? Then there is a long digression in, in of course, strict epic tradition <laughs> that gives us exact information on when and where and how Odysseus got that scar. And once that digression is over, some uh, hundred lines or so, uh, the famous scar of Odysseus, then Odysseus, still disguised as, uh, as a beggar, knows that he's been recognized and he, he, he chokes Eurycleia and threatens her with death should she reveal his secret. Then he has a, a nightly interview with Penelope, who 
doesn't recognize him. And it is then that she tells him, the beggar, that on the morrow she will decide who her future husband will be. How? She will um, uh, give them Odysseus's bow and ask them to string the bow and shoot an arrow through 12 axes laid on the ground, their, their heads on the ground and their rings uh, um, uh, above. So they should shoot the arrow through the 12 rings and that will decide that the one who can perform this feat will be her husband. She tells that to Odysseus. And of course, the next day, the contest is announced. Uh, everyone tries their strength and their luck all fail. And of course, Odysseus, as a beggar, is also given a chance, marked at, of course, but he succeeds. Thereupon, starts, after completing the, uh, the task, starts shooting at the, at the suitors, and um, he is joined by, by Telemachus and the, the, the other faithful servants of, of the house. And together they slaughter all 108 suitors. Um, this happens in books 21 and 22. Book 23, uh, almost all of it is devoted to the reunion of husband and wife. Now imagine that Penelope is still doubtful that this is Odysseus standing before her. It is also unclear whether Athena has removed the guise of the beggar from, from off of him or no. The reason has it that, that he, he no longer looks as that horrible old beggar, but he looks himself. And she tests Odysseus once more by telling him that uh, she, she, she wants to think about these matters and that for that night he should sleep outside. And she tells uh, uh, one of the servants to, to take out Odysseus' bed from the bedchamber so that he might sleep in the hall. And then Odysseus says, but the bed cannot be taken out because it is built upon uh, at the stump of, a, of an olive tree. It is anchored to that, to that uh, stump of oli olive tree. It cannot be removed. And that, of course, uh, uh, reveals him as Odysseus. That, that was Penelope's test, because she knew that if uh, Odysseus had consented, then it, it was not really Odysseus, because he he didn't know that the, the, the bed could not be moved from the bedchamber. And then book 24 is the book of, of final recognition where Odysseus uh, goes on to meet his old father Laertes uh, in his garden and also to confront the relatives of the suitors who come seeking vengeance on Odysseus and, uh, 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 and his family. And there is almost an Iliadic scene of, of combat there between Odysseus and the relatives of, uh, of the suitors. But then all of a sudden, Athena comes down from heaven and pacifies all the combatants. And that is the end. Now, that is the plot of the Odyssey. Um, we, um, we are going to focus on just a second, the beginning and book nine of this book, where we will learn much about Odysseus, about Xenia, and the gods. So you can see that this is not Richmond Latimore's translation, if you've read it. Uh, you could sense almost immediately the different style, the different manner of writing uh, uh, 
between uh, Latimer and uh, the translator here, Robert Fagels. Now, Robert Fagels translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey were just about the most highly acclaimed translations um, in the closing days of the 20th century. They were uh, the products of the mid 90s. Really highly acclaimed and for good reason. Uh, they read very eloquently. Uh, at times, the, uh, the English is almost colloquial, but then again, it does retain a certain uh, 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 air of formality. The line numbers, by the way, are not the line numbers of the Greek text, but of the translation. Now, if you are reading it as a translation, it shouldn't matter to you. But if you want to make uh, comparisons with the original, it can at times be difficult, uh, even though uh, we are given the uh, lines of the original at the top of the page. So you see these numbers at the top of the page uh, stand for the lines of the Greek. So the Greek lines uh, 43 to 71 are translated in here on this page, which uh, as far as the translation goes, um, uh, encompasses lines say 51 to uh, 80, 84. So there is a discrepancy between the, the lines. Now, why? Uh, there was no such discrepancy in Latimore's uh, translation because Latimore managed to um, uh, 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 translate more or less line for line. Uh, here, due to metrical considerations, uh, the meter that Robert Fagels employed uh, required him to uh, use a greater number of lines. It doesn't mean that he adds information. It's not that he invented sentences that are not there in the original. It's that that his metrical scheme was such that he required, he limited himself to a number of syllables in the line that required him, or, or rather obliged him, to uh, uh, add lines of, of, of text. That is, uh, uh, what in the Greek is expressed in one line, in English is expressed in a line and a half something like that, but he does not add information. Well, you might ask, what is this meter that he employs? I cannot really tell because it is a meter that is of his own devising. He speaks about it in his introduction. Um, he claims that he has lines of six beats, that is six central points of stress of five beats, of seven beats, and of three beats. You remember what I said uh, regarding a similar point in, in Richmond Latimore's translation. Well, I consider that prose, but that's just my consideration. Um, to some, this might read as, as true poetry, I find the meter here too, too diverse, too changing uh, from one line to the next to find any regularity in it. And if there is one thing that is regular about Homer, it is his meter. True, he can use the hexameter line in Greek uh, in, 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 in fascinating versatility, but still it is a hexameter line. It doesn't change. Here, it changes so often that you, you cannot find your footing. Um, that being said, the translation as such is very powerful. In, and, and, and as you read it, it, it grows on you. Um, um, it's very beautifully done. And so we begin in the beginning. You see that there are... Uh, headlines here. There's a headline, there's a title for the first book. It's called Athena Inspires the Prince. That is the decision of the translator. There is no such title in the Greek text. The Greek text, it is 
the first rhapsodia, the first song, the first book. And just as we had in the Iliad, so too here we have an invocation of the muse. Sing to me of the man muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again, of course, once he had plundered the hallowed fights of Troy. So if the main theme of the Iliad was the rage of Achilles, the main theme of the Odyssey is the man. Andra moi enepe musa polutropon. Of the man, muse, sing to me. The man of twists and turns. Now, Achilles, the main hero of the Iliad, was known for his great impetuosity, his great vigor, his great combat skills. Odysseus, too, is a great warrior, but he is best known for his uh, uh, subtlety, for his ingenuity, for his many ways, twists and turns, both physically, because he wandered here and he wandered there, and the workings of his mind, his, uh, his, his, his um, ability to um, use his reason, uh, his logic, his um, great uh, 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 talent at uh, uh, devising schemes. Um, so the man of twists and turns, driven time and again, of course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Many, the, many cities of men he saw and learned their minds, many pains he suffered Heart sick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. So we are, in fact, being told again. Yeah, uh, we listen to the Odyssey being recited, not because uh, it's a great story, also because it's a great story, but the end is known in advance. Again, the, the, the pleasure is derived from the poetry, the way it is written, the words, the, 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 the verse, okay? So we, we, we are, we're being told right at the very beginning that all his comrades did not survive. Why? The blind fools, they devoured the cattle of the sun. The sun God blotted out the day of their return. Launch out on his story, muse, daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time too. So this is the invitation of the muse, the proemium of the Odyssey, where we know that we are going to be speaking about the man, Odysseus, and um, that... It is a, a story of, 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 of trial and tribulation, of great adventure and great disaster because uh, Odysseus, uh, uh, hard as he tried, did not succeed in saving his comrades, uh, his comrades because the blind fools devoured the cattle of Helios, the, the sun god. Now we begin by now, all the survivors, all who avoided headlong death, were safe at home, escaped the wars and waves. But one man alone. Mind you, we are still in the Proemium. This is still background information. One man alone, his heart set on his wife and his return. That one man, Calypso, the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess held him back deep in her arching caverns, craving him for a husband. But then, when the wheeling seasons brought their year round, that year spun out by the gods when he should reach his home, Ithaca. And now we have some information what goes on in Ithaca. Though not even there would he be free of trials, 
even among his loved ones. Then every god took pity, all except Poseidon. So um, we know that by now, All the heroes of the Trojan Wars, those who had escaped headlong death, were at home. Menelaus and uh, Nestor, even Agamemnon, reached home only to be slaughtered by his wife Clytemnestra and her lover Aegisthus, mentioned in, a, in, a, in, a, in just a, a few uh, <clears throat> more lines. So all are safely back at home or dead. But there's one man who, though he pines for home, is held prisoner by Calypso on the island of Virgigia. Calypso, the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess, uh, who craves him for a husband. But all good things must end, from the viewpoint of Calypso, of course, because the wheeling seasons brought the year round. That year when it, it was decreed by the gods that he should return home to Ithaca. And we, we, are, we are being told that even there he would not be spared trouble. But when that year came around, then every god took pity, all except Poseidon. He raged on, seething against the great Odysseus. Till he reached his native land. And now, Poseidon, luckily, is not at the great assembly of the gods. Why? Because he is enjoying a feast among the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians are always mentioned when a god is visiting them and that they inhabit the ends of the earth. Okay, so Poseidon is not on the scene and the gods are all in assembly at the palace of Zeus. But the other gods at home in Olympian Zeus's halls met for a full assembly there, and among them now the father of men and gods was first to speak, sorely troubled, remembering handsome Aegisthus, the man Agamemnon's son renowned Orestes killed. So now Zeus is speaking about Aegisthus. Aegisthus was Clytemnestra's lover, Clytemnestra, the wife of Agamemnon, who killed him when he uh, murdered him when he returned home from Troy. Here it is said that uh, Aegisthus was uh, uh, the murderer. One way or another, he, he, he was there. He was an accomplice uh, uh, to the murder of, of, of Agamemnon. And now Zeus is recalling that and he says, Ah, how shameless the way these mortals blame the gods. From us alone, they say, come all their miseries, yes, but they themselves with their own reckless ways compound their pains beyond their proper share. So this is a great truth. We like to complain, we, uh, humanity, most of it, likes to complain, how ill-starred I am, what bad luck I have. Um, and we blame, of course, fortune, the stars, the gods, but it is not the gods because uh, men say that from us alone, from us gods alone come all their miseries. But no, it is they themselves with their own reckless ways who compound their pains beyond their proper share. And this is the example of Aegisthus. Look at Aegisthus now. Above and beyond his share, he stole Atrides' wife. That is Clytemnestra, the wife of Agamemnon. He murdered the warlord coming home, home from Troy, though he knew it meant his own total ruin. How did he know that? Far in advance, we told him so ourselves, dispatching the guide, the giant killer Hermes. Don't murder the man, he said. Don't court his wife. Beware, revenge will come from Orestes, Agamemnon's son. That day he comes of age and longs for his native land. So Hermes warned, with all the goodwill in the world. And did Aegisthus listen? 
No, no, he didn't. But would a just this hardened heart give way? Now he pays the price all at a single stroke. So the lesson to be learned here is that we must not blame the gods for all the ills we experience. Rather, we should look well whether it is not we who are really to blame for uh, not heeding the warnings of the gods. Good. Why is that lesson being <clears throat> given to us? Oh, sparkling-eyed Athena drove the matter home. Father, son of Kronos, our high and mighty king, surely he goes down to a death he earned in full. Let them all die so, all who do such things. But my heart breaks for Odysseus, that seasoned veteran cursed by fate so long. Far from his loved ones, still he suffers torments off on a wave-washed island, rising at the center of the seas. So, yes, it is, it is clear why Aegisthus should have suffered and died. He disobeyed, or rather ignored, the gods. But look at Odysseus, such a reverent, God-fearing God hero. He suffers. Olympian Zeus. Have you no care for him in your lofty heart? Did he never win your favor with sacrifices burnt beside the ships on the broad plain of Troy? Why, Zeus, why so dead set against Odysseus? My child, Zeus, who marshals the thunderheads, replied, what nonsense you let slip through your teeth. Now, how on earth could I forget Odysseus? Great Odysseus, who excels all men in wisdom. Again, notice that Odysseus is known for his wisdom, his trickery, his resourcefulness, his twists and turns. Excels in offerings, too. He gives the mortal gods who rule the vaulting skies. No, it is the earth shaker Poseidon, unappeased, forever fuming against him for the Cyclops, whose giant eye he blinded, godlike Polyphemus, towering over all the Cyclops' clans in power. So uh, Zeus is quick to renounce all responsibility, saying, it is not my fault that Odysseus is not home yet. It is through the anger of Poseidon. Okay, but now, the majority is against Poseidon, and they have all decreed that Odysseus should return. As I told you, uh, uh, Calypso is politely and emphatically informed that she should uh, let Odysseus go, and go she lets him. Um, so th th these are the opening lines of the Odyssey. Uh, uh, the proemium uh, followed immediately by the council in heaven, where it is uh, uh, almost unanimously decreed. I say almost unanimously because Poseidon is not part of that decision. It is almost unanimously decreed that Odysseus should return home. And the message, as I said, is uh, emphatically conveyed to Calypso. And now we will turn to what is perhaps the best known of all the Odyssean stories, the story of Cyclops. Now, uh, just to get things straight, Cyclops, Kuklops in, in, in Greek, that is round eye, is the singular, Cyclopes, the plural. Uh, Robert Figgles takes uh, a, a different view here. For him, Cyclops is both uh, uh, singular and plural. Okay, we will accept that. So, um, the story of the Cyclops, I say again, is part of Odysseus's story to Alcinous. All the Odyssey, or, or, right, or, or rightly the uh, uh, more precisely, the Odyssean uh, uh, voyages are told uh, in first-person 
bio disease in that banquet to Alcinous and uh, uh, the other uh, participants in the feast. That is why you will see Odysseus speaking in uh, first person, I, etc. So um, it's line 168 in the translation. When young dawn with her rose red fingers shone once more. This is, again is one of the formula uh, lines of the Odyssey. Um, the Greek is emos erigeneia phane rhododactylos eos. Okay, so rhododactylos eos um, is eos of the rose fingers, of the rosy fingers. Eos, that is dawn, the goddess of dawn. So when young dawn with her rose red fingers shone once more, how much more beautiful and poetic this is than saying just, when, mor when morning rose once again, when the next day appeared, when young dawn with her rose red, red fingers shone once more, we all turned out intrigued to tour the island. Okay, and they are speaking about the island of the Cyclopes. Um, I will, of course, not read everything, uh, just to tell you of how many men Odysseus was in charge. It says here, a dozen vessels sailed in my command. So Odysseus, now I remind you once again, all all the, the princes and kings in the Iliad were exactly that, princes and kings. Odysseus came to Troy with a, an army, with a fleet of uh, 12 vessels, 12 ships. So he had with him a dozen vessels. So they spent time on, on that island uh, hunting and uh, feasting. And then another day elapses, um, and again we have the, formu the formulaic expression, um, when young dawn, uh, where is it, when young dawn with her rose red fingers shone once more, I called a muster briskly, commanding all the hands, the rest of you stay here my friends in arms, while, uh, I will go across with my own ship and crew and probe the natives living over there. So there's another island close by. What are they? Violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? So again, it is this irresistible curiosity of Odysseus that cannot let go of him. He must know the land and its inhabitants. And so they go on board and land at the, uh, at the nearby island um, and they spot a cave. And we are told at the very beginning, here was a giant's lair, in fact, who always pastured his sheep flocks far afield and never mixed with the others, a grim loner dead set in his own lawless ways. Here was a piece of work by God, a monster built like no mortal who ever sucked on bread. No, like a shaggy peak, I'd say, a man mountain rearing head and shoulders over the world. Okay, so we, we <laughs> right at the very beginning, we are being specifically told what is uh, uh, to come in a very short while. This is who resides in that cave. But then uh, we are also told a, a very uh, important piece of information, but I took a skin of wine along. And then there's quite a number of lines describing that fabulous wine, that miraculous wine. So um, the ruddy, irresistible wine that Maron gave me once 
You am his son, the priest of Apollo, Lord of Ismaras, because we'd rescued him, and so on and so forth. But then uh, some of the qualities of that wine, which will become very significant in a very short while. Um, uh, what magic, what a godsend. No joy in holding back when that was poured. Okay, so they took that with them and uh, they entered the cave. They entered the cave. Now, why? Why did they do that? Because a sudden foreboding told my fighting spirit I'd soon come up against some giant clad in power like armor plate, a savage, deaf to justice, blind to law. So there is no better definition, in my view, of the word premonition. When you have a premonition of something, it is a, usually an ominous sense that something bad is going to happen. So we, we are giving all the clues that something bad is going to happen. Okay, they enter the cave. They see that it is laden with cheese and milk. What do his comrades say to him? Let's make away with the cheeses, then come back. Uh, 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 hurry, drive the lambs and kids from the pens to our swift ship. Put out to sea at once. Let's take what we can and go away. But I would not give way. And how much better it would have been. So this is told, of course, of course, in retrospect. They tell me, let's go back. Let's take what we can and, and fly back. But I would not give way. Not till I saw him. Saw what gifts he'd give. Because Odysseus expects Xenia to be respected. He wants his host, whoever he may be, to give him guest gifts. But he proved no lovely sight to my companions. Okay, so they build a fire there, and then Polyphemus enters. Okay, he enters with great noise, with great clamor, and um, um, then down he uh, uh, squatted to milk his uh, ah, no, before that, then to close his door, he hoisted overhead a tremendous massive slab. No 22 wagons, rugged and four-wheeled, could budge that boulder off the ground. I tell you, such an immense stone the monster wedged to block his cave. These are all important details. Um, and so... He sits down to do his chores, a farmer's chores. He milks his, 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 his sheep and goats. And then he notices Odysseus and his comrades. Strangers, he thundered out. Now, who are you? Where did you sail from over the running sea lanes? Out on a trading spree or roving the waves like pirates, sea wolves raiding at will, who risk their lives to plunder other men? Now, the hearts inside us shook, terrified by his rumbling voice and monstrous hulk. Um, so Odysseus, Odysseus is quick to say, um, men of Achaia we are and bound now from Troy, driven far off course by the warring winds over the vast gulf of the sea battling home on a strange tack, a route that's off the map, and so we've come to you. So it must please King Zeus's plotting heart. We are glad to say we are men of Atreides Agamemnon, whose fame is the proudest thing on earth these days. So great a city he sacked, such multitudes he killed. And now, since we've chanced on you, we are at your knees in hopes of a warm welcome, even a guest gift. So they expect to be uh, the recipients of Xenia, the sort that hosts give to strangers. And these are important line, lines. That's the custom. 
Respect the gods, my friend. We are suppliants at your mercy. Zeus of the strangers, that is Zeus Xenios. Zeus of the strangers guards all guests and suppliants. Strangers are sacred. Zeus will avenge the rites. And of course, uh, 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 Polyphemus despises the gods, belittles them, and for this he will have to answer. Stranger, he grumbled back from his brutal heart, you must be a fool, stranger, or come from nowhere telling me to fear the gods, or come, um, sorry, um, or avoid the wrath, okay? Um, we Cyclops never blink at Zeus, and Zeus's shield of storm and thunder, or any of the blessed God, or any other blessed God. We've got more force by far. Now, this is a clear case of uh, Hebris, I would say, uh, such disdainful treatment of the gods. So, um, um, uh, then he, he goes on to ask Odysseus as to the whereabouts of his ship. And uh, Odysseus is very wise not to tell him that his ship is mooring not far off, but rather that it, 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 it has been shipwrecked. Uh, how does the um, Cyclops react? Not a word in reply to that. Ruthless brute. Lurching up, he lunged out with his hands toward my men and snatching two at once, wrapping them on the ground, he knocked them dead like pups. Their brains gushed all out all over, soaked the floor, and ripping them limb from limb to fix his meal, he bolted them down like a mountain lion, left no scrap. Devoured entrails, flesh and flesh and bones, marrow and all. We flung our arms to Zeus, we wept and cried aloud. So he is found out to be a man-eating cyclops, a man-eating uh, uh, monster who uh, has just now devoured two of Odysseus's comrades, um, only to do so again the very next day, and so on and so forth. Um, and then Odysseus decides to kill him. But could he just unsheathe his sword and, and, and strike him uh, and, and stab his chest where the midriff packs the liver? I groped for, the, for, for the, the fatal spot, but a fresh thought helped me, held me back. This is the wisdom and, and uh, uh, the far-sightedness of, of Odysseus. Um, there at a stroke, we'd finish off ourselves as well. How could we, with our bare hands, heave back that slab, he said, to block his cavern's gaping maw? So we lay there groaning, waiting dawn's first light. So Odysseus knows that even if he can uh, kill uh, Polyphemus, that would do him no good because there is no way that he and his uh, crew, even if they join forces and try to heave back that great slab of stone blocking the entrance to the cave, they will not be able to do it. So they would all be trapped in there and die as well. So another scheme is required. What is that scheme? How uh, uh, does it unfold? Uh, we will, of course, uh, discuss next time, um, even though it is probably known to you. So uh, what, what we will do next time is this. We will <clears throat> finish the story of uh, Polyphemus the Cyclops, and we will have a look at the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus return, that is, from a totally different point of view that of his wife, Penelope. And we will do that by reading a Latin poem written 
by the poet Ovid in the first century uh, BC, um, uh, part of his Letters of Heroines, that is, letters that were written by uh, mythological heroines uh, uh, to their loved ones. The first one is from Penelope, an imaginary letter, of course, from Penelope to um, Odysseus. Great, great. So uh, I will see you all next week. <laughs>